put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Today we are going to look at Revelation chapter 12, a fascinating story about a battle between the superpowers of the universe. I've titled it The Battle of the Giants. Revelation is God's protection from last day delusions. If we study it carefully, we will see what history has in store for us. Revelation 12 describes an enormous struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And to understand the struggle, we have to go right back to the beginning. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 27. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Jehovah God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Genesis 3, 1. So he questions God's word. Of course, the serpent was just the first transcendental medium for another power, Satan, who was behind it. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Genesis 3, 2 and 3. So here the great conflict begins. God knows, says the serpent, that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, 5. Sadly, much of the world today believes the serpent rather than God. And after this event, after man fell, the Bible tells us, he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden the cherubim and the flame of a sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So man was cut off from the tree of life and the wages of sin is death. So death and suffering came into the world because people ignored the word of God and chose to believe the words of the serpent. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died, Genesis 5.5. 5. So at the moment he sinned, he began to die. Without Christ, spiritually he was dead from the moment of sin. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3, 15. As soon as sin entered the world, God had the solution. He promised the Messiah that would come, and that the Messiah would crush the head of the serpent, but that the serpent would bruise the Messiah's heel. This is what is embodied in this prophecy. And the woman referred to there is God's people out of whom the Messiah would come forth. Now in this battle, this verse has very often been placed upon its head, turned upside down, inside out, to portray another doctrine. For example, the Dewey Rames online Bible, which is the Jesuit version, says in verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed, and she, not he, shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for a heel. Of course, Mary is the one who is put in the place here. She becomes the one who overcomes. Revelation 12 verse 1 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed in the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Here is a pure woman. And she, being with child, travailed in birth and pain to be delivered. The woman would bring forth the man-child, just as it was promised there in the book of Genesis. Out of God's people came forth the Messiah. But the enemy was there, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Here was another power, assuming the seven, assuming to be deity, and it would bring in a counter-doctrine so that the Messiah 
would not be regarded as the victor. In Roman Catholic doctrine, as we have it expounded here on their webpage, heartscare.com, the woman of scripture is no surprise that the woman would triumph over the red dragon. The Bible said he, not she. For scripture says so at the very beginning. And here are the re refer to Genesis 3.15 where they quote the Dewey Rhymes version and not the Bible version of Protestantism. And I will establish a feud between thee and the woman, between thy offspring and hers. And there again we have it. She is to crush thy head while thou dost lie in ambush at her heels. They continue to say to Mary, the woman of scripture and mother of men who keep God's commandments and hold fast to the truth concerning Jesus. And they quote Revelation 12, 17. The church applies the beautiful words of wisdom, 726. Here quoting an apocryphal book. She, the glow that radiates from eternal light, she, that the untarnished mirror of God's majesty, she, the faithful image of his goodness. The only one who is the faithful image of his goodness is Jesus Christ. And there is no room for putting in another mediator. Because Mary is full of grace, Luke 1, 28, the church through Pope Pius the ninth in his Ineffabilis Deus, an apostolic constitution issued in December 8, 1854, confirmed the tradition that held Mary as being conceived immaculate. Here we have a totally new doctrine, unbiblical, which is placed in the place of the truth. When they refer to the commandments which she would have us keep, they are not referring to the biblical commandments, but to the papal commandments. Because remember, the Pope can modify divine law according to Prompta Bibliotheca Papa Article 2. So the papacy claims this power, and they have done so. The Ten Commandments as they are in the Bible versus the Ten Commandments as they are in the Roman Catholic Catechism. The Second Commandment which forbids idolatry has been removed and to get ten again the tenth one is split into two thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods and of course the fourth commandment moves up into third place and the Sabbath is replaced with Sunday the church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment referred to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's Day, Catholic Encyclopedia. Think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So this battle between truth and error has been waging ever since its inception. It reached a high point in the religion of Babylon, and it's reaching its ultimate conclusion in the antitypical Babylon. Revelation 12.4 and his tail, referring to the serpent, drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. So Satan fell from heaven and took one third of the angels with him. That's good news. So for every evil angel there are two good angels. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour a child as soon as it was born. So when the Messiah came into the world, Satan was ready to destroy him. And she brought forth a man-child, he, not she, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So here we have the birth, the death, the resurrection, and Jesus' ascension into heaven in one sentence. Roman Catholicism replaces these sentences with another mediator. And the woman, the church, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God 
that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. This is a reference to the time of papal supremacy. So when the fledgling Christian church started, the dragon was ready to destroy her, first using pagan Rome, which also has the dragon as its symbol, and then using papal Rome. As soon as they had a biblical basis, they were under the ire of the dragon. Now, if we look at this war where Satan fell from heaven and took a third of the angels with us, we read in Revelation 12, 7 and 8 that there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So they were removed from heaven. We have to ask ourselves, who is Michael and who is the dragon? Now we know who the dragon is, but who is Michael? The word Michael or Michael means the one who is what God is. So Michael is called in Daniel 10.21, your ruler. Now, who is our ruler? In Daniel 12, 1, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. Who is the great prince who stands for God's people? But Michael the archangel, when a contending with the devil, he argued about the body of Moses, Jude 9. Who can argue about a body as to whether it belongs to God or to the devil. Who can resurrect? And the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Whose voice will that be? And with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 John 5.28 tells us that it is the voice of the Son of Man. So this archangel Michael is Jesus Christ. He's not an angel like any others, although he probably had the form of them before he became man, because he had created them in his image. This angel, this archangel, is the one who is what God is, Michael, the one who stands for his people. The angel who redeemed me from all evil, Genesis 48, 16, only Jesus Christ can redeem us from all evil. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flame and fire, Exodus 3, 2, and he received worship, which no angel actually receives. Therefore he has to be God. Jesus Christ is Michael. So Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. In all their affliction the Bible tells us he was afflicted and the angel of his presence, he who tells us what God is and through whom we have access to God, Jesus Christ, save them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, Isaiah 63, verse 9. So the Bible is very clear that Michael, the one who is what God is, who's also referred to as the angel of his presence or the archangel, the one who redeems and resurrects us, is the one who had this battle with Satan and his angels. These two giant forces met. Satan lost in heaven, he will lose again on this earth. The dragon, let's just make sure, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. There is no doubt as to who we are referring to in this passage. Isn't that sad? that there are even Christian denominations today that doubt the existence of the devil. So where did the devil come from? 
Ezekiel 28, 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the days that thou were created, till iniquity was found in thee. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitudes of thy iniquities. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all of them that behold thee, and never shalt thou be any more. It's very clear that the devil will be destroyed. There will not be an eternal burning hell. But this devil was created perfect. He was Lucifer. He was without sin. But he had freedom of choice because love demands freedom of choice. A love that is compelled is no love. So because he had freedom of choice and was created perfect, he still had the capacity to choose against God. Love demands freedom of choice. And he made a choice to rebel against God and he lost his place in heaven. Now if we go into esoteric doctrine, I don't really want to go there, but I will show you how far they go. This comes from The Secret Doctrine by Blavatsky, volume 2, page 388. The appellation Satan in Hebrew, Satan an adversary from the verb, verb shatana, to be adverse, to persecute, belongs by right to the first and cruelest adversary of all the other gods, Jehovah, not to the serpent which spoke only words of sympathy and wisdom and ease, at the worst even in the dogma, the adversary of men. So esoteric doctrine turns it upside down and makes good evil and evil good. The Bible says, woe to those who make good evil and evil good. She continues to say, therefore Jehovah was called by the Gnostics, the creator of all and one with Ophinomorphos, the serpent, Satan. Or evil. That Michael being simply Jehovah himself, one of the subordinate spirits at best. This is phenomenal. So Jesus is made a subordinate spirit and they equate Michael with Jehovah, which is correct, but they turn it upside down and they make good evil and evil good. Amazing. We read in Revelation 12, 7 to 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, and was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the battle is raging down here right now as it has raged then. He was cast out of heaven, but he is on this earth. And he uses his systems to pervert the biblical teachings. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Revelation 12, 10 to 11. We need to cling to the testimony of the Word of God, and none of us will be lost. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea! For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. The battle between these forces is raging today as vehemently as it raged in heaven. Now, let's continue with this study. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. So we have the church, the people of God, those who are faithful to God, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head the crown of twelve stars, standing for the twelve tribes of Israel, 
the twelve apostles in New Testament times, she being with child, cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. She brought forth the Messiah. Now let's have a look at this symbol and see whether this is the church or whether it is an individual woman. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in its wings. Malachi 4 verse 2. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. Psalms 89 verse 36. So this woman is clothed with the sun. Here used as a symbol for Jesus Christ. It shall be established forever and the moon as a faithful witness in heaven. Psalms 89, 37. So she stands on the faithful witness. I have likened the daughter of Zion, this is God's people in general, to a comely and delicate woman, Jeremiah 6, 2. So the symbol of the woman is the symbol for the church. Now who is Zion? Say unto Zion, thou art my people, Isaiah 51, 16. So there is no biblical injunction for taking this woman and replacing her with one individual woman, no matter how noble that woman was, as Catholicism does by placing Mary into that position, and the war rages then between the dragon and Mary, rather than Jesus Christ and his people against the dragon and his followers. Isaiah 54 verse 5 says, For thy maker is thine husband, and the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord has called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, says thy God. So the woman is the bride of Christ, the church, throughout all ages. Hosea says, And I will betroth thee unto me forever, yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you, says Paul, to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.2 The scriptures are very clear. The woman represents God's people and not an individual woman. Revelation 12.2 She being with child, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered, so out of the church the Messiah would come forth. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. It was a man-child. It's not a woman fighting this battle, but a man-child. And a child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Revelation 12, 5. John 4, 22 tells us, Ye worship, ye know not what. Ye know not what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. You see, the Messiah was to be born in the Jewish nation. And this is what the woman is a symbol for. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalms 2, 7-9. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with which he should smite the nations. It is always the he, never the she. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. So the battle of the giants is between Christ and Satan. And Christ is the protector of his people, and Satan is the one that hovers over his people. And there appeared this wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. He's ruling and he has the number seven. He assumes the position of God on this earth. He's the one who dragged the angels out of heaven, a third of them, 
and he was ready to destroy the man-child as soon as he was born. So the issue is about Jesus Christ. And the issue is sal about salvation in Jesus Christ alone versus the dogmas of the dragon, which make mythology its basis rather than biblical truth. Herod was convinced that this prince would want to take his throne and so he sent out his soldiers after the birth of Christ to go and kill all the little male children that were born. But God whisked them off. The skeletons that we see here are supposedly to represent the skeletons of the little children that were killed at that time by Herod. But uh, whether that really is so or not is open for conjecture. Jesus was taken to Egypt and when the time was ready, they returned and he could start his ministry. But the devil hounded him and eventually Jesus was crucified for our sins. He, the innocent one, died for us, the guilty. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 23. So if the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, that by his death he might destroy him who holds power of death, that is the devil. Hebrews 2, verse 14. So the greatest apparent failure turned out to be the greatest victory ever experienced in the universe. The foe was vanquished, the price was paid, the way to eternal salvation for all who should believe in him was opened. The devil hasn't been re-eradicated, he hasn't been removed from the scene, sin is still raging, but the price for sin has been paid. So the Old Testament church was guided and protected by God so that it pro could proclaim and bring forth the Messiah. And the battle shifted from heaven to earth between these two great mega powers. And the dragon persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, so he persecuted Israel. And nevertheless, the Messiah was born. And when the Messiah had been crucified and the fledgling church started out, then the dragon persecuted the woman. He persecuted this new fledgling church that would proclaim salvation in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. First using pagan Rome and then turning to papal Rome to accomplish His purposes. But the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred three score days, Revelation 12, 6. God's church never disappeared. Although Christianity absorbed the pagan culture and a pagan form of Christianity started ruling on earth, those that held to the Bible and the Bible alone survived by fleeing into the solitary places of the world. So the church that harbored the truth and the word of God fled. I have pointed thee each day for a year, Ezekiel 4, 6. So the 1260 day prophecy translates into 1260 years, literal years of papal supremacy as a horn power, a political entity with power to persecute. In fact, this time period is found in Daniel 7, 12 and a number of times in Revelation. If we read the number, it's very interesting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven times this number appears. A time, times, and the dividing of time in Daniel 7, 25, Daniel 12, 7, time, times, and half a time, Revelation 11, 2, 40 and 2 months, and then the 1260 days. And Hebrew parallelism tells us that it is always the same power that we are dealing with in these prophetic time periods. 
So 538, the time when the papal power was established as a secular political entity, if we add the 1,260 years, we come to 1798. In 538, the Justinian decree, where the Pope was declared the corrector of heretics, went into effect, and this time period started ticking. In 1798, the Pope was taken captive, the papacy was declared no longer to be a political entity and the time period came to an end. So the church in the wilderness, as we find it in Revelation chapter 12, represents the church in the wilderness as described in Acts 7.38. A tabernacle pitched in the midst of his people, Numbers 151-53, showed that Jesus was concerned about his Old Testament church and Jesus in the midst of his people, John 1.14, the fulfillment of the tabernacle, the antitype, Jesus himself, still concerned about his church. Papal Rome becomes the persecutor. When Constantine took over and put on the cloak of Christianity, then Christianity became the popular religion, the pagan Dogmas were incorporated into its culture and Christianity had now become popular and a large proportion, perhaps a large majority of those who embraced it only assumed the name. They are as much heathen as they were before. Error and corruption now came in upon the church like a flood. This comes from Weary's Church History, page 54. This tendency to meet paganism halfway was very early developed. Upright men strove to stem the tide, but the apostasy went on, till the church, with the exception of a small remnant, was submerged under pagan superstition. The two Babylons, page 93. So paganism conquered the church, if we may say so. They will turn away from listening to the truth and give attention to legends, 2 Timothy 4, verse 4. And very soon the pagan day of worship was made the Christian day of worship. Constantine was the first one to lift up the new standard in his Edict of Constantine in A.D. 321. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in the cities rest and let all workshops be closed. So he made a Sunday law. So Revelation predicted that thousands would be deceived as the false teachings of ancient Babylon entered the church. Ephesians echoes this in chapter 6 verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So this battle between Christ and his people and the devil and his people continues to this very day. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 13, And the dragon persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Well, that is history. We all know that it happened. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. Revelation 12, 14. The church in the wilderness during that time period, who was she? And what will the culmination of this great battle be? I believe history repeats itself. The three worthies were thrown into the fiery furnace, but a fourth individual was amongst them in their trial. Jesus did not leave them in the hour of their trial, but he sustained them. The Council of Laodicea, Canon 29, the Roman Catholic Church in its fledgling state, not yet as a political giant residing on the earth, also made a Sunday law. But note that this is an anti-Sabbath law, and this is where it gets interesting. Christians shall not Judaize, keep the Sabbath. Constantine had made a law which said you will keep the Sunday, but this 
organization made a law saying you shall not Judaize an anti-Sabbath law, just as Pharaoh had done. Get ye to your burdens, you Moses make the people Shabbat, rest, keep the Sabbath. Get ye to your burdens, an anti-Sabbath law, and the plagues came. Here we have an anti-Sabbath law. Christians shall not Judaize, keep Sabbath and be idle on Saturday, Sabbath original, but shall work on that day, but the Lord's day, they shall especially honor. So the battle hots up between these mega giants. Now the church in the wilderness represented those people that clung to their Bibles, like the Valdensians, the Albigensians. They fled into the solitary places in the Alps. There they held their services in caves and in solitary places. Faithful men and women of God kept the lamp of truth burning. They learnt whole passages of the Bible off by heart. Their crowning offense was their love and reverence for Scripture and their burning zeal to make convert. Many of them had the whole of the New Testament by heart. Surely if ever there was a God-fearing people, it was these unfortunates under the ban of church and state. The sign of the Vaudor discerned worthy of death was that he followed Christ and sought to obey the commandments of God. This comes from history of the Inquisition of the Middle Ages. This was the story as unfolded in the book of Revelation that was here enacted in reality. Great numbers were driven from their habitation with their wives and children stripped and naked, many of them inhumanely massacred. The History of the Popes, Volume 2, page 334. And these people were hounded some were burnt in caves, their children were destroyed, they were thrown off the mountain cliffs. And here in these Alps, in their solitary places, they inscribed the Bible, they wrote little pieces. In this valley to this day, the things are very different to elsewhere in Europe. Very fascinating place to be in the valleys in the north of Italy where these unfortunates crept away. Here is their college de Barba, where they inscribed the Bibles and wrote them. This is the very table in which they faithfully copied the scriptures and hid them in their clothing and spread them throughout the world. Here is a little Valdensian church where these Sabbath-keeping Christians upheld the Word of God. This is the very cave in which many of them were killed when they held their services in this cave. This is the river that runs through the valley. History tells us that it ran red with the blood of the Valdensians as they were slaughtered. When the Reformation had finally obtained the victory over certain areas of Europe and they were left alone from persecution, then the Valdensians joined the Reformation, but sadly, they gave up the Sabbath in the process for the sake of peace. This is the actual decree that went out against them in 1163, where the Synod of Toulouse decided that the bishops and priests take care and forbid under pain of excommunication every person from presuming to give reception or at least assistance to the followers of this heresy, which first began in the country of Toulouse. Now this heresy was Sabbath keeping. Whenever they shall be discovered, neither were they to have any dealings with them in buying or selling, that being so deprived of the common assistance of life, they might be compelled to repent of the evil of their way. Whoever shall dare to contravene this order, let them be excommunicated as a partner with them in guilt. As many of them as can be found, let them be imprisoned by the Catholic princes and punished with the forfeiture of all their substance. And King Ildefonsus of Aragon banished the Valdensias and the persecution commenced thereafter. Therefore, by this present apostolic writing, we give you a strict command that by whatever means you can, you destroy all these heresies and destroy them from your diocese, all who are polluted by them. You shall exercise the ecclesiastical power against them and all who have made themselves suspected by associating with them. 
They may not appeal against your judgments, and if necessary, you may cause the princes and the people to suppress them with the sword, the source book of medieval history. So this is history. This is a fact. It cannot be denied. It took place, and the Bible says it will repeat itself. But they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Revelation 12, 11. So the church in the wilderness was harbored by God, and the truth, the flame of truth, was not allowed to die. Out of these humble beginnings, the Reformation was kindled, and the Valdensias will be remembered for their tremendous contribution in terms of Scripture and their understanding of Scripture and the effect that they had on the Reformation itself. John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, the first one to say, let's give the Word of God in the mother tongue to the people. He translated the Bible, but his version of the Bible did not find distribution because the printing press had not been discovered. John Knox, the great preacher who preached in Scotland and said, give me Scotland or I die. Hus, all of these martyrs, except Whitecliffe who died a natural death, but he was dug up later and his bones were burned. Hus was promised free passage, but he too was burnt at the stake. Here, from this pulpit, he preached. And the interesting thing is, they were not allowed to say the Mass, so all he had was the Word of God. Amazing people, these Hussites. These are their songs as they were written, and they regarded the Pope in Rome as the King of Babylon. And they have written it here on the walls of their ancient churches. They depicted the battle between these forces with uh, pictures and drawings because they were not allowed to speak publicly. This is the trial where he was found guilty and executed. But God raised up Martin Luther and raised up Melanchthon. We need both the Luthers and the Melanchthons. We need those that will crash through the wall in this fight against apostasy. And we need those that will put on the brakes and speak kindly like the Melanchthons. Tyndall translated the Bible into the English tongue and the same that was present there in Luther's time was made available under tremendous persecution in England. Calvin fought the battle in Switzerland after fleeing from France and here the blood of the Hussites and the Huguenots is remembered. Here in Prague, upon this bridge over here, they hung portions of the bodies of the Protestants to show what the consequence of their actions would be. And in southern Africa, where the Huguenots fled, they put eventually this monument to commemorate the woman clothed with the sun that broke the shackles of Rome and basing its faith on the Bible and the Bible alone, fled. Martin Luther will be remembered for his famous words, Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. He put his faith in the Word of God and the Word of God only. The funeral pyres of the Inquisition were lit. Heresy was declared. Any form of deviation from papal doctrine, deciding for yourself what you want to believe, Medals were struck when persecution had culminated in some major persecution event. And the serpent cast out his mouth, water as a flood after the woman, and the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth, Revelation 12, 15 and 16. The woman fled into the wilderness. This new wave of persecution, the Inquisition, flood of people, nations, multitudes and kings was sent after the woman and she fled into the solitary places again. The earth opened up and received the woman. That's the places where there were not waters 
other words, nations, multitudes, peoples, kingdoms. So they fled to the New World. They fled to the United States of America that was opening up. They fled to Southern Africa. They fled to Australia and all of those countries. And Christianity, Bible-based Christianity, spread around the world. And these persecuting powers were swallowed up. And he says unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Revelation 17, 15. But God protected his people. So in the new land, they prayed and they founded constitutions based on biblical principles. And God's word was kept alive in a land of liberty and other places that received the woman around the world. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, 17. There is another persecution to come. The Bible says that history will repeat itself. So the woman that was nurtured during the 1,260 years eventually spread throughout the globe. Eventually there will be a remnant of that seed, those that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So the faith is the Bible and the Bible alone and obedience to God's precepts. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So the great battle between truth and error is not yet over. The battle was started in heaven when Satan rebelled against the government of God and against the law of God. When God said, this is how it must be done, in other words, he laid down the law, there was a rebellion on this earth, a rebellion against God's word, a rebellion against God's government. When God sent his only son to bear the sins of the world, the devil was ready to attack him. When his church started spreading the good news, the devil was ready to attack that using pagan Rome and papal Rome. When they had spread throughout the world, eventually the battle would come back to where it started in the beginning. Obedience to God's requirements. Blessed are those that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into their city. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4 verses 4 and 5. There aren't many Gospels out there. There's one Gospel. There aren't many faiths out there. There is one true faith. The faith must be Bible-based and it must incorporate all the aspects of obedience to God. The battle between good and evil which started in heaven and has raged throughout the centuries between Christ and His people and the devil and his people is about to rage again. There will be a confrontation, a final confrontation between the woman clothed with the sun and the woman that rides the beast. But the Bible says that the victory belongs to the woman clothed with the sun because her faith is in Jesus Christ, the only one who can save us, the only one who has life within himself, the only one who has promised to crush the head of the serpent. <laughs>